I don't know what it was. He's walking upright like a man. Sightings in and around Vermont. Bigfoot sightings across New England have been reported. Red glowing eyes, about seven feet tall. Red eyes, big old fangs, claws coming out through. Three inches long, you know, just sharp as they could be. There has been another UFO sighting flying over the Royal Botanic Gardens. There are 500 UFO sightings in the world every month. The truth is out there. Let's pull up disgusting, disgusting stuff. Oh, no. <laughs> this is the book I got. Oh, yeah, dope. I saw that, the, the hoax book. That one I, I'm I'm legitimately excited for. Oh, no, I'm like stupid, stupid, stupid excited for it because one, there's really good hoaxes in here. Yeah. And two, it made me realize that there's a whole nother realm of possibilities for Cryptopedia that we can go into. Hoaxes? And that's that's literally hoaxes. Yeah. Of totally. every variety, because I think the core conceit of Cryptopedia is the notion of hidden. And yeah. Hoaxes are literally one person hiding information deliberately to try and trick people into believing something. And there's a real, my, I think I was reading through this in Grand Central Terminal, and it has the, uh, it has like the moon hoax in here, which is really great. <laughs> Wait, what? The moon's fake? No, no, no. That That is another hoax that's in here. Wait, that the moon itself is fake? Well, that's the moon is a hologram. Oh, yeah, which that's, is a thing. That's a thing. Well, I, I mean, if you'll remember on uh, last podcast on the left, I think Henry Zabrowski lost a girlfriend over the moon being a hologram. Oh, uh, well, that's fair. I mean, you've got that's that's something when it comes up, you've got to cut your losses because that's that's uh, that's something. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, I, who I'm, thought it was a hologram? Him or, or his girlfriend? He, he lost his mind. I think it was over the hollow earth episode and uh, the hollow earth hollow moon episodes or whatever yeah yeah i think he lost his mind shoot it was a weird day yeah how was that by the way how, how was how was the trip down to the city eh, it was it was okay i mean i enjoyed it we were there for like 14 hours so <laughs> and it, we got back at 2 a.m oh, last night and we're yeah. recording this at 11 48 a.m the next day yeah so I'm doing great right now. Nice. In terms of energy, I got a I got a lozenge in my mouth because my throat got agitated by the weed smells. <laughs> they can do that now. In the city, I, you sent me a picture of like a, I'll say a food truck type thing that looks yeah. pretty awesome. Yeah, it, it yeah. <laughs> I, I think I think I remember reading that the mayor is not going to uh is not going to charge people anymore, or he's, like, recommending that the cops don't charge people anymore. Yeah, that it, it's less enforced. Yeah, I, I think okay. that's the key. Um, I mean, I also went to a concert, so... Yeah, how was that? It was pretty good. I mean, saying what the concert is is going to reveal when we recorded this, but it was, uh, it was the Gorillaz concert, and live, they're pretty fucking good. Are they? That sounds awesome. Rhinestone Eyes Live might be my actual favorite thing ever. Is it? Yeah. Oh, man. Do they do they do like a death clock where there's like a screen that they record behind and there's bright lights behind them and they and they throw up their shadows? No, it, it's more uh, the guy who who is the real person behind the gorillas, the the voice of 2D. Yeah. It's more like a concert for him, and the gorillas like music videos and stuff show up behind. Him. Oh, that's cool. But they're like modified versions of it. Yeah. Which is pretty cool. Although I will say this off the album Humans, my new least favorite song is Strobe Light. What? And <laughs> the reason that? it's I love that song. Like normally I love that song. Yeah. At the concert, the strobe light was pointed directly into my eye. <laughs> so I enjoyed <laughs> that thoroughly. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that sounds great. Oh man. But yeah. So, I mean, it it was it was fun. I uh I spent way too much money on nothing. Was it a fun nothing? What kind of nothing are we talking about? I got I mean I got the book. Oh, nice. But I mean, a lot of like, you know, going through the city, everything's like 20% more expensive, so. Yeah. 
Oh, I feel like we should also note, because not everyone who listens to our podcast anymore is from New York. Uh huh. When we say the city, we mean New York City. True. Correct. That, yeah, yeah. That is actually a very important distinction. And even people in New York, if they're closer to Rochester or uh, Buffalo, they'll refer to those as the city. Oh, yeah. Well, I used to work with a, a gentleman who would say, hey, do you need anything? I'm going to the city. And by that, he meant Kingston. So he'd call Kingston the city. Now, that's just that's just anarchy. <laughs> there, there's a point, OK, like where you go from from the city being either Rochester, Buffalo, New York City or Albany. And then you just go for pure anarchy and you make <laughs> Kingston the city, which well, is insanity. He was he's not originally from the U.S., that guy. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, you know. Yeah. That's an important factor, I yeah. feel like. <laughs> but, um, oh, so actually, I'll tell you now, we actually have international listeners for real now. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. So we got... Well, let me speak in their native tongue. Hello. That's hello in Canadian. We do have a Canadian listener. Ah. But we have a Denmark listener, ah. an Argentina listener, and a Paraguay listener and I probably, oh that's a fun one yeah so i don't know i i, I found that to be kind of cool i so. did a full report on uh paraguay in school um mm-hmm. i forget most of it that was, that was a while back but uh it was fun i think that was one of the longest ones that i actually did in school because i enjoyed it most of my school reports i i, I really didn't like and just sort of did the minimum and and now i just sort of write this time 11 pages about just just bs so uh yeah. you wrote a full 11 pages about this week uh yeah page counts 11 i write it in f- to be fair the last two pages are plugs and sources that's fair and i yeah. do it in 14 font so it's easier to read uh okay because i'm like about to say i'm like i'm working on on next week still because i found I found a, a really awesome source that I want to read before I actually fit, say it's done. Yeah. And right now, I'm about, I'd say, 50 to 75% of the way through the episode, uh-huh. like planning for it. And content, I'm about three pages. Okay. So. Well, you, we have very different writing styles, I noticed, because because after we announce the creature we'll send the other person our, our copy so that we can sort of follow along and estimate where in the episode we are so we know how to pace ourselves. Yeah. And I've noticed that yours tend to be more outlines in your, uh, at least the ones that you share, and you're recalling information from sources that you have, and you do cite sources and pictures and stuff, so I can, you'll say something, and then I can copy or copy and paste it, or I can look for it and see the image. Yeah. Um, and I tend to write nearly verbatim, everything <laughs> everything that i say yeah i, I don't know I, i'm more of, for me it's it's like the research is me reading a bunch of stuff and then my my documentation is me remembering stuff yeah <laughs> so all right uh-huh. so i have literally no idea what this week's is so if okay. i do guess it this is gonna be this is gonna be a hat trick first of all Nice. Yeah, because we all know that you're a demon and you're psychic. Before we do jump in, there are two items I'd like to note. Item the first, I noticed you sound extra sultry today. Is that a new mic I see? It is, in fact, a new mic. Oh, yeah, it's we got a bump a, going on. I don't remember what the name of the mic is. It's an it's Audio nice. Technica. Yeah, you're the one who recommended it. So <laughs> I actually, uh, what is it, the 2020, I think? Something, yeah. It's, yeah, I like it a lot. I'm replacing a... $15 condenser mic <laughs> that I've had for about four years now, uh-huh. meaning, and it survived a move. Yeah. So I'm sure the capsule on this is great, and that is totally the reason. That's that's why my previous track sounded so good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for new- nerds who are keeping track, I'm on a CAD Audio GXL2200 BP that I got lucky and found on Mass Drop. The second note is that there was a shoot across the street from me last night. So today they're packing up. So I'll do my best to keep 
any erroneous sounds out, but there are, you know, people loading gear into a large truck with like the gates that lower and all that. So if you hear any clinks, clanks, bangs, or people talking or, or diesel engines idling and all that, I'll do my best, but that's what that is. All right, so. <coughs> you right there? Yeah, I'm, I'm prepping my tubes. Okay, okay. Welcome to Bigfoot Loves Movies, the game show where each of your hosts are forced to watch cryptid-themed romantic comedy movies and answer a series of increasingly difficult questions. Stay till the end because the winner gets to watch the loser on closed-circuit television as they are dragged deep into our test facility where they are used as live test subjects for Cryptopedia's prototype line of ballistically projected Bigfoot tranquilizers. I'm Brandon. I'm John, and I didn't know that was coming. Um, uh, I want to just say, I want to just say, I would really like to watch cryptid-themed romantic comedies. Yeah, I, I was pretty happy with that. <laughs> like, a lot. Like, the Jersey Devil would have a phenomenal romantic comedy, I feel yeah. like. Oh, like, that would be fantastic. Now, I think there's two ways you could go with a cryptid romantic comedy, and that's cryptid and cryptid, or possibly more interesting. Actually, no, I take that back. I was going to say cryptid and human, but that goes into like the vampire werewolf and, and all that. And uh, just no. Well, I've read some um, some historic accounts involving Bigfoot and a appendage that looks like a child's arm with an apple attached to it turning ah, inward yeah so that sounds pretty interesting to me so i don't, I don't know what you, i don't know what you're talking about oh man our cryptid this week it's a big one its origins are old early written records begin to appear in the 1300s it may be found across many countries and its name at this point has become synonymous with folklore and its very name may be used to describe many other types of creatures and it's anthropomorphic in appearance. Do you know what it could be? That's a really vague one. So it appears in multiple cultures. Yep. Hmm. This might be the first one I don't know off the top of my head. It's See, because big, it's old, it's all over. It's anthropomorphic. It, that sounds like that almost sounds like Sasquatch, but thirteen hundreds is way too. Way too late for Bigfoot or Sasquatch. Because, well, because, you know, yetis, yada, yada, yada. There's, let's see, zombies, vampires, but those are not really cryptids. They're anthropomorphic. They're more urban legends. Or not urban legends. Yeah, I'm going to have to to say I have literally no idea. Oh, wait, wait. Could it be fairies? What the fuck? It, it was fairies? It was fairies. John. <laughs> John, that's fucked up. I want you to know I was intentionally leading you because I was saying it was big. It was anth I was trying to describe Bigfoot. And it's goddamn fairies. John. I, I want That John. was literally my thought process. I I went through. I didn't leave anything out. There were no jumps in that. That was my train of consciousness right there. John. Yeah. Stop it. This, <laughs> I was intentionally trying to mislead you on this one. I can tell. That. Well, I. So when I wrote that, I. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, man. All right. I just forwarded you the copy so you can see what I wrote. Uh, it should be in your email. Let me know if it doesn't go through. Okay. Yeah. But right under where it says the creature of this week is a big one and there's bullet points describing uh where it's found in that. Look uh -huh. at the text I put in green immediately under any guesses on what it could be. If he guesses he's a literal fucking demon, he'll hopefully guess Bigfoot. What the fuck, John? <laughs> Look what he wrote immediately under that. That's how confident I was. The first line under that green text. Wrong. I got you, you, you psychic wannabe. It's fairies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, my God. I'm dying. Um, I was so confident. Well, well, here's the thing I want to point out. You said, 
you said the, the fact that you said 1300s that's what made me not think it was big yeah fun. i wasn't gonna lie i would i will intentionally mislead with the truth but not lie mm-hmm. and you're a goddamn demon well uh, once again i feel like we should go into the fact i have read an extensive amount about an extensive number of cryptids <laughs> So, I have a slight horrifying advantage in terms of stuff like this. And, not only that, we also, as I think I mentioned on one of the previous episodes, we used to play games where you would try and stump me with things. Yeah. So, I am uniquely suited to beat your your riddles, I feel like. That... Anywho. You're batting a thousand. This is insane. Okay, let me... Go by my script. Wrong! I got you, you psychic wannabe. It's fairies. Yep, yep. You you got me. I got you. The word you fairy, me. as described in Laura Creedy's 1916 book, A Study of Fairy Tales, was, quote, given by Thomas Kittingly in his fairy mythology in a later appendix of his tales and popular fictions. In the Latin phantom, to enchant, the word is derived directly from the French form of the root. The various forms of the root were Fatum in Latin, which means to enchant. Fee or fieri, uh, which is illusion in French. In Italian, that's fata. And in proven, uh, I'm not sure what provangle is. Uh, that may be a form of Italian, but it is fata. Fairies, as we know them today, are small humanoid creatures with wings, often shown as butterfly wings, small enough to hold in the palm of your hand. But this was not always the case. The word fairy in history could be used to describe any creature as long as it was small, somewhat humanoid in appearance, and had special abilities, such as elves, goblins, gnomes, hobgoblins, bogarts, brownies, etc. So, and- to... Oh, you know what? I literally... <laughs> I, I was literally about to ask that, and I see it on the on the copy. I was about uh-huh. to ask, what about red caps? Yeah, so red caps may have actually been described as fairies at one point, and I did find several sources that listed red caps as a form of fairy, uh, which okay. you may recall from our first episode. So elves are fairies, goblins and hobgoblins are fairies. Uh-huh. Are green goblins fairies? <laughs> what about red goblins? Because this is important. Because <laughs> the... the question the question becomes is one of Spider-Man's oldest foes actually a fairy? Um, one of Spider-Man's oldest foes lives down the road. (laughs) So I won't... (laughs) I have no further comment. Wait, what? Willem Willem Dafoe lives down... uh, Oh. uh, Yeah. (laughs) I have no problem with Willem Dafoe. I'm talking about Spider-Man in the comics. Willem oh, Dafoe. gotcha. Willem Dafoe is the per- perfect Green Goblin. <laughs> I just want to point that out. Oh, yeah. No, he's the fantastic man... and great in everything. He's also somewhat local. So, Billy, if you're out there and you like fairies, give us a shout out. God damn it. All right. <laughs> so, moving on. Now yep. that I've uh, I've sidelined us with talk of Willem Dafoe. The word fairy could also be used to describe someone's ability. One example I found was that someone who was exceptionally chivalrous and was good at swordplay could be called a fairy knight. Fairy has at times been used as a synonym for enchanted. Think fairy forest and enchanted forest as being interchangeable. These, I believe, are plausible roots for where some current turns of phrase come from. The most recent example I could think of is if someone was to be called a computer whiz, whiz being short for wizard. No one thinks that he's a literal computer wizard. They're just describing his skill at using the computer. And the song Pinball Wizard by The Who in 1979 describes someone who is exceptional at pinball. This is also why I started calling Fred and Kevin at work the IT fairies. I can guarantee that they love that. As someone who works in an as a developer slash IT person, being called an IT fairy is the greatest of all compliments that someone who's gone to college for four years <laughs> in many cases to learn about, you know, how to properly debug things, how to properly set up computers and manage a shop of people who don't know how to use computers properly. Uh huh. I'm sure their favorite thing in the world is being called an IT fairy. <laughs> 
oh, they love it. They're super grateful. They they really love me because I've somehow managed to go through on my work PC, kill one hard drive per year for the last four years. Okay, so... Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I don't have words for that because I have... So... I, I, I manage some servers. Yeah. And we don't kill a hard drive in five years. And yeah. we're pushing serious data through those hard drives. I, I'm through four hard drives, three NVIDIA K5000 graphics cards I've killed, uh, uh, and I think I have the most RAM in the company, and I have the, the largest issues with... Um, uh, he started talking about IT stuff. I'm not super technical, so I don't 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 quite understand. But Rammy stuff. Okay, yeah. So that probably means that you use a bunch of stuff that is like swappy and whatnot. Well, I use. I asked him about it, and I have a slightly beefed. My computer is a little bit beefier than everyone else's, and I asked him how come mine is. Uh, I have all these troubles, and. It made me smile when he said, oh, that's because you're the only one that uses the software to its full capability. <laughs> so enough of that. One quick side tangent is uh, about the song Pinball Wizard by The Who. Pinball Wizard is about someone named Roger Sharp. Pinball, as it turns out, at one point in time was outlawed in the United States as gambling. And this was a state by state thing. And eventually all states outlawed uh, pinball's gambling because you would pay money. And they thought it was more of a game of luck than skill. Only after Roger showed up to a courtroom in Manhattan with a black market pinball machine and called out every shot he was going to make and then made it, did pinball then become legal again in the United States, slowly moving from Manhattan to the West Coast. What? Yeah, it's crazy. So, so wait, wait, was this like a... um? Like, a, the Goonies pinball machine that he was playing? Or is this, like, a pachinko game? It's... You know, I don't know what the, the actual pinball machine was. It was... Uh, pinball was outlawed. All the machines went away. Manufacturers still stuck around. So you could sort of buy and sell pinball machines. And you could also uh-huh. go to, like, shady places that had these. And I, I actually don't know what his, his specific pinball machine was. Oh, I see oh. that face! Oh, it's like a legit pinball machine. I thought like like it's like a modern pinball machine. I was yeah. thinking it was like Pachinko. No, no, it's an actual modern pinball machine. Because this was when they were there was a big crackdown on gambling and they they figured pinball there's no way that could be a game of skill. That got swept to the side. They wrote special legislation to allow the lottery to continue to exist because the lottery is gambling. So the law outlawed the lottery, so then they had to write a thing to let the lottery to continue uh, to exist. So while we were talking about that, I was Googling furiously pinball <laughs> Roger Sharp. Yeah. I've sent you an image, which we should probably link in the show notes. Uh-huh. This this man is is like killing this pinball machine like a, a, an executioner. Like, the look on his face is that of a man beheading someone. Oh, God! Yeah! That's that's probably a, a public official destroying the now illegal pinball machines with a sledgehammer. <laughs> yeah, I, I find that amazing. I don't know why. Like, But that it's just like, why? Like, you could have taken the glass and repurposed it for something. Yeah. That's, that just seems like a waste. Yeah. Ah, people are idiots. Mm-hmm. So, given the massive body of work regarding fairies, and it's and given that it's October, I'll be focusing on lesser-known aspects of these creatures, at least to Americans who are 20 to 40 years old. The nefarious, mm. evil, and wretched acts performed by this mischie- these mischievous creatures. I will state, however, that the Fae warrant follow-up episodes breaking down the chronological history of fairies by region, for the nerds, this episode is going to be more of a grab bag, touching on a few varieties of fairies that have a spooky Halloween twist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, 
if we just talk about fairies as a culture, almost, wait, that was a weird thing I just said. Yeah. Fairies as a culture. Hmm. Like the fey culture or fairies yeah. in culture? I, I meant to say the categorization of fairies. Yes. We'd be cutting out like a ton of possible episodes. Oh, yeah, yeah. So this is intentionally more of a Halloween, let's make a spooky fairy episode. Let's do a twist on a thing that's for little kids. Um, yeah. And as I got deep into it, it turns out that there is significantly more, there's a wide breadth and depth to all of the different uh, fairy-related things. I think I, I'm looking at the outline for this episode, and some of the things that we're even talking about during this episode, they are definitely 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 episodes in themselves oh yeah oh yeah so i'm not gonna i'm not gonna waylay you anymore i would love to hear about the, the first fairy on this okay list. to start we'll be taking a brief trip through the little known act of fairy vampirism in the 80s author patrick logan wrote about his time as a child and what it was like growing up in ireland as would happen he as a kid uh, like many other kids, I did this a lot myself, he'd play outside, and one day, he and his two friends found what he described as a fairy mound. Wait, I looked wait, up... wait, wait. Yeah? 80s? Like, as in 1980s? In the 1980s, but he's recalling his time as a child. I okay. don't know his age Okay, when okay. he's talking I... about it, but this is, in, imagine, I don't know, 40, 50 years earlier. So this is, like, relatively modern. Oh, story. very modern. Super modern. That's... Okay, continue. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In fact, there were people who Patrick Logan was recalling his time as a child. There were modern accounts in the 80s of fairy vampirism. Yeah. The 80s uh, were crazy. 80s were a weird time. I feel yeah. like a lot of people, a lot of people. A lot of people said a lot high. of things in the 80s. <laughs> oh, I feel yeah. like a lot of people were high in the 80s. Yeah. There was a lot of stuff that was legal uh, in the 80s. Yeah. Yep. So fairy mounds may be one of two things. I believe when he says fairy mound, that's something that's a regional item from where he came from. Fairy mounds could either be uh, an old fort formed from concentric stone walls, mostly constructed during the Bronze Age, or more likely, given what they proceeded to do, a ring of mushrooms. Yeah, I... I've I've read about that and I've heard about that. Ring of mushrooms seems like the easiest explanation. Plus, you know, different different types of fungi probably grow in different patterns because of oh, their yeah. spore spread and things like that. So. Yeah, we those are all over. So rings of mushrooms are naturally occurring. It's a group of mushrooms that either grows in a ring because of the what's in the ground around there. That's just how they grow. Or there are some mushrooms where it's one mushroom that just grows as a it looks on the surface as a ring but they're all connected underground oh huh i didn't yep. know that so he and his friends proceed to dig up the fairy mound the entire group then developed tuberculosis all were convinced that it was caused by the vengeful fairies tuberculosis commonly known as consumption is a disease famous for its symptoms one of which is coughing up blood tb or tuberculosis is believed to be a sign that you've fallen victim to ver fairy vampirism as late as the 1980s. And that references not his account, but other accounts that were modern in the 80s. Wait, so tuberculosis, an epidemic, mind you. An absolute epidemic, yeah. which we have, I think, don't we have a vaccine for it now? Hopefully. My memory, yeah. So people believed... Until the 1980s. Yes. That it was just fairies. Yeah, not, at not... least one source or way to get it. So you could probably get it other ways. But okay. if you had, if a fairy was to, to feed upon you, you would get TB. So there may have been other sources, but one, fairies. So it's not more likely that everyone got TB because they're all friends and interacting a lot, and if one of them gets it, inevitably all of them are going to get it. Yeah, I think definitely in Pat's case, that's more likely. Yeah, I, I think so too. Just from like 
yeah, you all dug up mushrooms, but you're also all just, you know, hanging out a lot. Because I'm assuming yeah. you're a bunch of, like, you're a bunch of rapscallions running through the streets if you're digging up mushrooms for some reason. Yeah. So the next fairy is the Scottish Glacing Rias. Often vampiristic, Glacings were said to cut the throats of hunters and drink their blood. So we are fastly moving away from the kid's fairy tale version of a fairy. What? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I'm just... What? Th that's that's horrifying. Oh, yeah. And I will be throwing a lot of words around glacing and a few other things that come out of nowhere. Those are all regionalisms describing fairies, and they could mean different types of fairy. But if you hear me say something you're not familiar with, just in your head, insert fairy. Yeah, I think that's fair. I, I already have been. <laughs> <laughs> the least malicious of the species insisted on continual libations of milk. Such offerings were still being made to them into the isos. That, I, by the way, could not find a definition for, or okay. isos. I assume it describes a period of time in Scottish or Welsh culture. I couldn't okay. find a, a really good source for it. If you try looking it up, you get a bunch of weird uh, BS. But feel free. Uh, otherwise, they would kill or maim cattle and the human owners. Some so, insist... Yeah? So, that... I, I hate to, like... I hate to be that, you know, grand unified theory of the paranormal and the supernatural. Yeah. Um, but that sounds like an awful lot like a alien Chupacabra. abduction. Oh, alien abductions! Like, yeah. a lot. Like, a lot, lot. Like, not just a tiny bit. That's like... Almost a... That, that's a magical version. <laughs> With the exception of milk. <laughs> yeah. It's... <laughs> it's definitely a... Maybe that's why the aliens are mutilating the cattle. They don't know how to milk. What if... What if aliens... Are... Fairies that... Don't like to seem like they're doing magic. And they just really like sci-fi. <laughs> Like what if what uh -huh. if aliens are what if aliens are like the goth fairies, right? <laughs> so yeah, they're too so, cool for magic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they yeah. they've they've used magic to make fake technology that looks like technology, but it's actually just magic. <laughs> and they're creating these these false realities, but they still got to do all the same stuff, right? Yeah, they have to because you know. Just like a red cap who has to have its cap always cut, drenched in blood, this one apparently needs to constantly be drinking milk. <laughs> so, uh huh. So they still need to get that good, good milk. Yeah. But you know what? We're gonna be aliens now because <laughs> we're different. <laughs> They're the nonconformist fairies. Nonconformist <clears throat> fairies. Oh man. I feel like that explains a lot of alien abduction cases. Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> oh, oh. Some insisted that it was necessary to keep all glacings, even those who appeared friendly, at an arm's length with a dirk. If permitted to come close, a glacing might assume the attributes of a vampire and suck a man's veins dry. Dastings were also known to take the form of a man's beloved and vampirize him, absorbing his heart's blood. I assume dasting is a female form of glasting. So, I just want to point out, most dangerous things, uh -huh. keeping them at arm's length of a dirk is generally the way that you deal with them. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's yeah. not... So, So you know how there's always, like, in these, these types of folklore myths and legends, there's always, like, a weakness that something has, usually, just so yeah. people can feel in control? Uh-huh. Dirk is a generally a good weakness for most things. Oh yeah, Dirks are definitely one of my many weaknesses. Oh, it's it's number one on my list. I think. Yeah. Well, <laughs> bullets probably first, but you know, Dirks up there. Bullets are just sky Dirks. <laughs> flying Dirks, flying yeah. little Dirks. <laughs> Jeez. All right. So to escalate a little bit, in 1911. Wait, 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 wait. Escalate. Yeah. Escalate from absorbing his heart's blood? 
Yeah, well, this this is a slow escalation all the way up till the end where you actually solve one of them. Okay. <laughs> really? We solve one? Yeah, and by I okay. solve, I mean someone else did, and I'm just telling you about it. Okay, yeah, I was about to say, because, like, there's some people who probably have put some real effort into this. Oh, yeah. And I don't, I don't malign them at all. I'm actually, I, I, for the next cryptid that I'm doing, I bought a book by someone who did a lot oh. of research. Yeah. On your hoaxes, that. there are a lot of fairy hoaxes that are out there. So that's another thing where if it's not in the book, we can keep that one on the back burner somewhere. Oh, 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 I know. The the like the one where someone literally took illustrations out of a book that you can find today and took pictures of them oh, as yeah. though they were real fairies. They, and there's the uh, what were they the the cuddlingy fairies? They were literally like little paper mache figures that were. <laughs> they were like he took a picture of a girl and took a picture of these things, cut them out, and then copied them on top of each other. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's. I th- I think we're thinking of the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, it's funny because you can literally, if you find the book that they came from, you can look at the book and then look at the artwork in the picture. And you're like, yeah, this is like one to one. The pose is even <laughs> the same. <clears throat> so okay. in 1911, American anthropologist Walter Yeeling Evans Wentz, who's got one hell of a name, published it is a, a pretty book- good name. It's such a, there's a lot of people with really good names. I feel like this field of research has attracted everyone who has a good name. Oh yeah, you have a minimum of four first names before you're even allowed to do any folklore. It's true. Yeah. So Mr. Wentz published a book called The Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries, or Celtic, I'm not quite sure on the pronunciation. He interviewed a then 73-year-old Neil Colton from Tamlek Township. Or so Tamlek, you know how I right? know... You know how I know Neil is the person who's being interviewed? How? He's only got two first names. Yeah. <laughs> Walter found Mr. Colton as rumor around town said that he had a reputation for having seen the gentle folk. Now, given the extent that fairies show up in folklore around this time, you've got to be seeing that shit everywhere to get to be the guy with the reputation. Yeah, also, Gentlefolk is like like a, a almost dog whistle for talking about fairies. Oh, yeah, well, there's nice versions. These are just the not nice versions. Yeah. Um, Gentlefolk also reminds me of uh, what they call the uh, wildlings in Game of Thrones, the free folk. It, it actually, what it reminded me of was the Holdafolk, which is the uh, Norse one. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. But you know nothing. Yeah, I know nothing. Walters met with Colton and his three sons around a fire, and he was told the following. One day, just before sunset midsummer, and I, a boy then, my brother, cousin, and myself were gathering bilberries up by the rocks back there. So he's talking about an area near his house where, where they're sitting. When all at once we heard music, we hurried around the rocks, and there were within a few hundred feet six or eight of the gentlefolk and they dancing. When they saw us, a little woman, dressed in all red, came out from them and towards us. She then struck my cousin across the face with what seemed to be a green rush. What? We ran home as hard as we could, and when my cousin reached the house, she fell dead. Father what? saddled a horse and went for Father Ryan. Yeah! What? So this guy. Neil and his brother and his and his cousin were out picking berries. They heard some music and saw a group of fairies. And apparently the gentle folk hit you with the green rush, which is like a switch or like a little branch, slaps her in the face and she gets ho- she arrives dead. So I was going to make a joke about them being like the Midnight Society. I thought that that was a rich vein of yeah. humor because, uh-huh. you know, they're all huddled around a campfire trading stories about fairies but uh-huh. then the story itself completely took that <laughs> out of me what there's a sharp left turn in the story you're like, going okay berry picking there's music i see the gentle folk they're dancing they're singing we're amazed and then she just kills his cousin <laughs> but, but doesn't just kill the cousin 
slaps her with a a, a green rush, which is like yeah. a stick, right? Yeah. Like a, yeah. So slaps her with a stick so hard that presumably she gets like some kind of internal hemorrhaging yeah. that allows her to continue to move. And by the time she reaches home, she drops dead. Yeah. Yeah. But the, yeah. <laughs> so so do fairies have like superhuman strength? Fairies are fucked up, man. I don't know what else to tell you. I don't know how strong they are for their size. They're, uh, I don't touch on it, but some say that they are fallen angels. Uh, okay. So that they were not good enough to be angels. Like, they, there was a revolt in heaven, and then they were cast away, but they weren't bad enough to be in hell. So maybe they're just, like, the, 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 they're positing then that Earth is, like, a, posi- uh, um, a purgatory for angry angels. <laughs> so, so maybe? I'm just... There's a lot to process. There's a lot of crazy fairy stuff. You you put so much insane stuff on me just there. It's hard to even make a good joke. <laughs> like I feel uh-huh. like what you just told me is in itself its own its own joke. Yeah. So like, there's not a whole lot I can do to add to that to make it sound. I, I'm 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 broken. I am a broken man. <laughs> The, I'm just I can't get over the thought like I'm imagining um, I'm kind of imagining like a small woman dressed in a red dress so uh-huh. like kind of um, I'm picturing the, the I don't know if how much Game of Thrones you, you watch or uh, yeah, if yeah, at yeah. all but the red woman from Game of Thrones but but like pocket sized yeah so she still has all the same proportions she's just yeah. pocket sized that's, that's basically what I'm imagining too just yeah. like runs up and then does like a jump where they hover like tune physics for a second. <laughs> Doesn't have the the green rush in her hand. She uh-huh. reaches behind her back in like a giant comical green rush, flings out of her hand and smacks the woman like on the head. <laughs> right? It's got to be. It's got to be uh-huh. a face slap. Oh, it's definitely. I, I'm picturing like a diagonal. Fr- she got hit. Her left eye, fairy's right arm, this whack, just real hard. Like, we're talking Looney Tune physics here. Oh, yeah. Is what I'm thinking of. Yeah, definitely. And uh, apparently, by the way, Colton foresaw the Princess Bride because as it would happen, his cousin was only mostly dead, and the priest brought her back to life during a series of, of rituals. Well, she got better. I think it involved a scarf, if I recall correctly. A scarf? Yeah, I think the priest used a scarf to bring her back from the dead, because a fairy hit her with a stick. Okay. Ireland's crazy. Yeah, well, there's a lot of jokes that can be made about the Irish, and I'm not going to make them, because they're low-hanging. I, oh, I never told you about this. I received correspondence Mm -hmm. from a person who works in HR, and... Not where I work. Another place is HR. And they said, you you should probably stop making sweeping generalizations about, uh, it was for years, so it was for Illinois. And I said, really? You've got a problem with Illinois? I said the Scottish can talk with the devil whenever they want. And uh, <laughs> your problem is with Illinois? <laughs> I, knew, I knew I was going to get in trouble for those Illinois bits. <laughs> But yeah, sweeping generalization. It's it's my favorite thing. Brandon here. A quick note, the next creature may involve sensitive subject matter relating to newborns. If this is a concern, feel free to skip forward 12 minutes, 56 minutes in, or until you hear the commercial. So moving on, Twilith Teg. Elion, Elolin, Gwilion, and Bendith Imamu, literally all translate to Mother's Blessing, is a specific type of fairy, and its traits are common in pop culture and uh, many films, Disney movies and other Hollywood films. Most people at one time or another have seen on TV a magical creature entices children to come with them to a magical land. Think Peter Pan or that uh, Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe. It, it's a common theme. In pop culture. Oh, kid- you yeah. know Mr. Tumnus was not 
not looking out for those kids. Best he interest. is not on the up and up at all. No. Never if, trust a man with a pan flute. That's what I say. I think Tilda Swinton was way more uh, was way more trustworthy in that movie, to be honest. Oh yeah. Like at the very least, she gave that kid Turkish delights. <laughs> is that a so. euphemism? I think that's a euphemism. No, no, they're literal Turkish delights. Oh, okay. I don't even know what a Turkish delight is. It's one of those like. <laughs> I, I think I looked it up once, and it's like one of those weird old time candies that yeah. modern people wouldn't enjoy at all Ugh, because gross, they're yeah. like they're like just barely above chalk, from what yeah. I've read. Why is black licorice still a thing, by the way? An aniseed? That's no, that should that should have gone I, away a long time ago. I don't know, man. People people in their taste, and you know, not to not to knock anyone who like stuff, but if you like black licorice, what are you doing? You're a bad person, and if you give out black licorice on Halloween, that's... Uh, that should be a crime. That, sh- that should be a punishable offense. Honestly, the thing that I think should be a crime is handing out candy corn on Halloween. But oh, like, just loose, loose candy corn? Loose. <laughs> that's that's criminal. I'm sorry. Oh. like That's just wrong. Like If you hand out like little packets of it, that's fine. Yeah. But the people who hand out loose candy corn, they're the worst. I, I always remember, like, you know, there's always that joke about people who hand out apples and stuff like that. But here's uh-huh. the thing. Apples, not that bad. I like but apples. But then again, we're also from New York, so we may have a slight bias towards apples. Apples, apples are the best. Apples are great. Yeah. Can't, loose candy corn? That just makes a mess of my bag. Loose candy corn? Oh, or it's in your pot. Your, your pants pocket and you put it mm-hmm. through the wash and then it sort of melts when you put it through the dryer that's the worst now a juicy bite of a nice honey crisp apple <laughs> oh oh man <laughs> <laughs> so the the magical creature either kidnaps the child or creates a copy of the person out of wood uh which is a theme in several movies and one of my all-time favorite tv shows Grim, which I highly recommend, especially given the time of season. Fantastic TV show. I think it's on Amazon Prime now. It used to be on yeah. a, uh, CBS, I think. It's great. It's great. Lots it's, of monsters. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. I, I got like, I think six seasons in, and then I kind of lost track of it. But that's oh, mainly that's because perfect, because I... they stopped at season six. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, then I, I must have gotten to like season five, because I got like, I got, I got, I got caught up when I was watching it. Uh-huh. And then I didn't want to wait for new episodes. <laughs> it's so good. G-R-I-M-M, if anyone's interested. It, it's yeah, great. yeah, definitely watch it. So these may all be derived from Welsh fairies. For many reasons, including spite, jealousy, raiding, and tradition, these fairies would go out and do these things. These fairies would come into a mother's home and pl- replace their child with either a magical wooden copy of the kid or with a fae child that looked somewhat similar and either way, the mother would care for the child. This is also a major plot point in the Netflix documentary Troll Hunters. Is it? I and never I, saw that. Well, well, it's not a documentary. I was making a joke about the fact that it's a children's TV show done by yeah. Guillermo del Toro. Yeah, but yeah. it's a major, major plot point. I won't spoil it. But, is it good? Uh, it's really good. I watched the first season and yeah. I loved it. I haven't finished the second or third seasons yet, but the first season's phenomenal. It's definitely got Guillermo del Toro all over it. That sounds pretty awesome. That yeah. I'll have to check it, because that shows up in my trending feed on Netflix. Yeah. I see I go, ah, it's a kid's show. But there's some kid's shows that, that they're, they're actually good. Yeah, the first season, the main character, I think, is voiced by the guy who played Scotty in the reboot of not Scotty check off. Uh, I was just going to say, I, I, yeah. I think he, he might not be with us anymore. We're, he unfortunately died. And the, the first season is dedicated to him because it was uh-huh. released posthumously. But I think Michael Sarah took up the mantle of the main character. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. So it, it's actually got a really good voice cast. I highly recommend it to people who are interested in like, cause it does a lot about troll lore, which yeah. is adjacent to fairy lore. Hmm. So they're pretty similar, just GIF and different geological uh, locations. It's like GIF and GIF. No, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so all of these, by the way, are ways in which pre-industrial families in pre-industrial Europe 
describe deve developmental disabilities, the passing of a child, and actions relating to sustenance of a family in the peasant class. Now, infant mortality and developmental disabilities, both physical and mental, disproportionately affected the effects of the medieval lower class. Families would at times resort to infanticide to keep themselves from starving. That is when I got seven pages in and went, oh shit, I can't. Oh. That's when I was texting you and I was like, how do we deal with if there's something that could be sensitive? Because there oh. are probably people who might have had lost a child or has had a child that had uh, uh, was Ooh. developmentally disabled. That's when I was texting, like, how do we handle this? What? I was seven pages in, and I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> Ooh, I mean, I'm not, like, I'm not surprised, but holy shit. Yeah, yeah, I went, oh, man. One source, D.L. Ashleman, a German professor at the University of Pittsburgh, said that a peasant family's sustenance frequently depended upon the productive labor of each member, and a person who was a prominent drain on the family's scarce resources could pose a threat to the survival of the entire family. The fact that changelings' ravenous appetite is so frequently mentioned indicates that the parents of these unfortunate children saw in their continuing existence a threat to the sustenance of the entire family, Changeling tales support other historical evidence in suggesting that infanticide was a frequent solution. Uh. Yeah. That's why is, I put that in red, so I could just edit stuff. That's horrifying. So, yeah. like, this is one of those situations where modern sensibilities tells me that this is screwed up. Yeah. But at the same time, this is difficult because we're talking about people who are substance farmers. Yeah. Like, we're talking about people who, if, if, if they subsistence, we're talking about people who, who um, if they don't make a harvest on time, they could die. Oh, yeah. Their, like, their entire livelihood is dependent upon physical labor and whether or not there, like it could be a perfect child, but the fact that there is a person who is consuming resources and not contributing and taking away from the resource of the parents because they have to now do parent stuff instead of farming, that could be a major uh, uh, risk to the family unit as yeah. a whole at that time. That's that's really um, it, it, it's one of those really unfortunate cases, right? Because yeah. like. On the one hand, I can see where the people are coming from, right? Because it, it, it's it's kind of the uh, honestly, it's like that moral problem, you know, the uh, the two tracks. Oh yeah, right. Where there's the switch, and you know, on one track there's one person, on the other track there's five people, right? Right now it's switched to be on the five person track. So you hit the button. So yeah, but but the, the the problem becomes then if you hit the button, you are directly responsible for that person's death. Well, if you don't hit the button, you're directly responsible for five people's death. That's true. And that's kind of the same moral dilemma that happens in this story. Yeah. In this this notion. Cause like that you know that it's an extremely real yeah. thing that happened in a very unfortunate uh set of circumstances. Yeah. Where uh I'm happy to not be in pre-industrial Europe. Oh, I would definitely be killed. Oh yeah, there, there, there's no doubt. I if I was in the if I was in the, the the time frame in which changelings are a thing and we have to work on the farm, there is no doubt in my mind I would have been killed because I am what you call indoorsy. Yeah, but we, we invented indoors for a reason. Yeah, yeah, that's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not making. I want to. I want to really couch this. I am not in any way, shape, or form making fun of people for doing this, and I fully recognize the gravity of what this is. I'm ma more making fun of myself on that one. I, I recognize my own shortcomings, mm -hmm. but yeah, no, that's that's uh, you know, I will say this though, that's not surprising. 
it's not surprising. It was a, a that's something that I don't think about a lot because there are, are a lot of TV shows, Game of Thrones, uh, Vikings, what have you, that are very popular and take mm-hmm. place in this time period. And I especially love high fantasy, uh, Dungeons and Dragons, and all of these other like Forgotten Realms, and uh, and and all that. And this is something that sort of brings everything back into perspective from those areas. And I think it's important that um, yeah, that that that's documented somewhere. Like, don't forget, you know, it's great to love all this this um, high fantasy and, and to to sort of romanticize the the era. But shit was real then. Yeah, you definitely need to contextualize things because if you don't contextualize yeah. things, you'll you'll hurt for it. You know, like yep. if you don't recognize that these phenomena have direct relations to other things, it's really easy to not understand and comprehend the set of circumstances that led to this. Yep. And if you ignore the set of circumstances that led to this event. In the future, you can unfortunately repeat those exact same issues. It's oh, the, yeah. the the history repeats itself thing. The uh, those who forget, don't learn the past are doomed to repeat. Yeah, totally. So, True. Yeah. Oh. Well, I. Th- oh, it's getting stronger. Yeah. Uh, We're receiving. I, I re- yeah. We're receiving I really don't. Signal. I really don't want to talk about my Illinois comments. <laughs> I'm really scared. It's we're getting a signal we're, from HR. We shit. We'll be back after we report. I'm probably gonna be replaced by a change. Today's sponsor is Himoi. Himoi is the latest in home and commercial butchery and meat processing sanitation technology. Just a few sprays of Himoi will instantly degrade organic and blood-like material to the extent where it is no longer detectable with common small particle reagents such as, but not limited to, luminol and similar products. Himoi is the best kept secret in industry and the preferred sanitation product of boutique butchers. Himoi for all your cleanup needs. Now back to the show. I'm going to go see what that crash was and then uh, pick up again because cats. 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 They've been playing with, um, they're, they're, I don't know what it's called. They're, it's like a plant that you don't have to water a lot. That a I have. Yeah, succulent. And there's moss around it and they, they <laughs> so, so there may or may not be a succulent down. We'll see. All right. It was a can of Pledge. Mm, <laughs> that'll do it. Yeah, they they knocked a can of Pledge off a table. Of course they did. Yeah, because why not? Well, well the reason the cats knocked the Pledge off the ca- table is because that's their... Um, pledge is like cat Satan. Well, anything on a table, cats hate it. That's why um, I have to yell at people all the time when they come over. For leaving the toilet seat up. Not because it's an issue, but because the cats knock stuff into the toilet because I've got a lot of like beard health stuff. <laughs> oh god. Right, right next to the toilet. <laughs> Do you <And> remember then... <laughs> this this just reminded me. Do you remember when uh the kitten uh Jiro was younger? Yeah. And Someone went to the bathroom. I think we were playing D and D. Oh! <laughs> Someone left, went to the bathroom. They yeah. left. They left the lid up on the toilet. Uh huh. And because the cat is a monster, uh-huh. and he persists on being a monster to this day, he um he basically jumped into the toilet because he was curious. Uh-huh. Um, he didn't freak out because the cat has no fear of water, which persists mostly to this day, but. I think it was your sister who discovered that yeah. he was wet. <laughs> and that was a yeah. That was a thing. She, for sure. She was petting it. She had him on her lap. <laughs> and it was 
giving him the good, good scratches and goes, oh, he's a good boy. What? Why are you all wet? And then I just saw your eyes move over into the bathroom. <laughs> and you go, oh, the door's open. Did you leave the seat up? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That that's my life with that cat. It, yeah. It's basically if you forget to do the things. Oh, did I tell you I have baby locks on my cabinets now? <laughs> that's totally fair. Because because <laughs> what happened was, and you were there for this when we came back from going somewhere. Yeah, all of my delicious, delicious pancake snacks had been eaten by this boy. <laughs> Oh, Jiro loves red bean. <laughs> he loves red bean, and that's not an understatement. We're just lucky that he didn't get his hands on the stupid sodium packet, because oh, oh, that would have been the bad. Yeah, yeah, the desiccant. Ah, jeez. Uh, <clears throat> so, in Ireland, on the Isle of okay. Man, located off the northeast coast of Ireland, has a fairy known as Leonon She, bearing much resemblance to a succubus. This creature comes from the land of the dead and is invisible to all but those she chooses as her victims. One source described them as Watching for the last person to leave a funeral, should it be a young man, she would take the form of a beautiful woman and make him promise to meet her in the churchyard in a month. When she sealed the promise with a kiss, she sealed his doom, for her kisses sent a fatal fire through his veins. And before the month was up, he died the death of a raving lunatic. Nice. nice. I mean, I mean, there's worse ways to go, I guess. Right? Yeah. Like, there's just worse ways to go. I mean, if you look at the, the Lee and C from Persona, there's uh -huh. worse ways to go. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. Uh -huh. Like, it could be a thousand times worse, but, oh, yeah. you know... You get you get succubied out of existence, you know. Mm. That's that's the thing that kills me about like the whole succubus myth and yeah. like the whole succubus lore. There's not a basically what that is is dudes being like, "Listen, I didn't want that to happen. <laughs> I didn't want it." It's like that episode uh -huh. of South Park where uh, like all the rich the rich guys have this 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 tendency to cheat on their their spouse. Oh yeah, and it's like. Well, I don't know why I did it. <laughs> and then they blame an alien. Yeah. As Shaggy would say, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. William Butler Yeats writes, She seeks the love of men. Her lovers waste away, for she lines on their life. Most of the Gaelic poets, down to quite recent times, have had a lean on she, for she gives inspiration to her slaves. She is the Gaelic muse. This malignant fairy, her lovers, the Gaelic poets, died young. She grew restless and carried them away to other world, for death does not destroy her power. So this guy is basically saying that this particular fairy is not so much an entity as it is the notion of a muse. So like it's it's literally like like it's it's the desire to create that fills people and like how over time that slowly, you know, eats away at you. Almost. Yeah. Okay. Th 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 yeah, that's a way of interpreting it. Yeah, no, I, I, I could see that. I actually, I think I like that explanation for this particular one quite a bit because uh -huh. it kind of fits in the whole like. Honestly, it fits a lot. Like, because the the idea is the the Leon Sid goes after their victims after a murder, at, at not a murder, a uh, a funeral. Yeah, right. Which makes a lot of sense to me because you go to a funeral and you're like, shit, what am I doing in my life? Now I'm gonna do a bunch of shit because. I feel unfulfilled or I'm having, you know, a crisis because this person I know is now dead and uh -huh. no longer living and they can no longer produce. So now I'm going to try and do stuff. So it seems like you're consumed mm. and it, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's poetic. Yeah, totally. So. Yeah. Author and folklorist William Carlton wrote in his The Lean In Sheet, like a leech fastened onto a woman appearing as a pro Protuberber, a protuberber. You want to give that another go? Appearing as a protuberance. Okay. Eh? Eh? You got Nailed it. it. You got it. 
got it in one. (laughs) (laughs) Tormented, the woman offered great riches to anyone who would free her by becoming host to her parasite. Fearing the woman's formidable power, the people of the community went for advice to their parish priest. Ironically, he was more frightened than they, for he knew that she is host. She was his cast-off concubine, not dead as he thought, but mad and possessed by an evil spirit. In an account which Carlton contends is true, the priest sacrifices himself, slashing his wrists to avoid offering she his blood and burning himself to free the woman of her parasite. Thus, says Carlton, the unchaste female has come to be called the Leonin Sheet, the priest's paramour, in particular, is called Leonin She and Sagarth. So, so that that's another version. So one was the yeah. muse of like poets. This one seems like it's a, I don't know what it is. It seems like it's a evil fae that latches onto a person and takes the form of a growth. And then in one account, she was trying to get rid of it, and a priest went through some extreme actions to try to resolve her issues. I think I'm gonna. I think I like the Muse version of this better. Oh yeah. Um, mainly because this version feels kind of gross to me because it feels like it's blaming the woman in a weird sense. Like it's kind of like the woman has become this evil entity, just a random ass woman. Yeah, well, I think in in this one, it was a normal person Mm -hmm. who then a lean and she attached itself to her and she was trying to convince someone to take the she from her to sort of pass it from one host to the other so she could be left alone. Okay. And that the priest in this case didn't do that or maybe, no, he did do that, but killed himself in a way so he'd accepted to be the host of it and then killed himself in a way where he knew the she wouldn't be able to uh, move on to another host. This this just feels weirdly masculine, like the story itself. Like It feels yeah. like it's, oh, look, this man has saved this woman from whatever, this, this uh-huh. ex-concubine. He saved yeah. her by sacrificing himself. I don't know. There's just something that feels disingenuous about this story. Yeah, totally. But I, I feel like the other one is more endearing. Uh-huh. So the final creature this week is the Kate Seedhay. It is described as a large black cat, approximately the size of a dog, sometimes with a white patch on its chest. The creature would appear near the deceased and steal their soul. Eventually, feel or file Fadalak, uh, which is a group of people who would wait near the body prior to burial, was formed there i just saw <laughs> saw final fantasy have you just been sending me final fantasy links <laughs> i've been i've been sending you uh video game versions of all the the seeds you've been sending me because literally all of them exist in every video game ever i did not do i i really did not do any pop culture research outside of stuff i already knew so i just threw in grim because i knew grim but you've been sending me stuff like clips from video games. <laughs> this um, is this is the one from Final Fantasy fourteen. It's a horrifying one. Oh no! It looks yeah. super friendly. That doesn't look like it's an evil fae. the The one above that, uh, the one above that, the uh, the one from Final Fantasy seven. That uh-huh. the, the the so the first one, the first two are from Final Fantasy seven. Is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, and then they brought Kate to. They they call it Kate Sith, which is just a yeah. different version of saying it. That's, uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's an alternate yeah. spelling. Yeah, yeah. They brought they brought Kate Sith back in um, Final Fantasy eleven and then fourteen. Uh-huh. So, so for for me in Final Fantasies, how are these creatures like? What are they in the Final Fantasy universe? Not, not what it is in real life at all. <laughs> if I remember correctly, Final Fantasy seven Kate Sith. Uh-huh is basically, like, he's just trying to get a bunch of money. Yeah. And Final Fantasy eleven and fourteen, Kate Sith is basically a protector of this, this like, really bad thing that has a bunch yeah. of bad creatures in it and is actually, like, a good person or a uh-huh. good cat, I guess. Okay. So, 
Although cool. I feel like I, I kind of buried the lead a little bit on this because I've, I've kind of... Oh, that's pretty cool. I didn't I didn't know that. It seems like for both the Mongolian Deathworm and in this case the, K- the Kate Sidhe or the Cat Sith, which is an alternate spelling that I found, both in Final Fantasy. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Final Fantasy... So Final Fantasy basically... It's that copy your uh, friend's notes in class, but change them up a little bit. Yeah. They, they tend to do that a lot. They have a lot of good folk. Although, I will say, they, they do use folklore to their advantage, and they use legend to their advantage. Like, yeah. I mean, an interesting thing about Final Fantasy VII is Sephiroth, right? Mm-hmm. That's a Kabbalistic notion. Okay. That's what actually... So the Sephiroth is like a a tree that has all these things on it. And I'm not going to go into it just because uh-huh. you know, I'm, in- I'm ignorant of it for the most part. I know it. I know to- how to recognize it. Uh-huh. And I know roughly what it is, but I don't know more detail about it. So I'm not going to go deep into it. But and a fun thing is the Sephiroth is also featured prominently in uh full metal alchemist. No shit. Yeah. So the door to truth, the, the weird symbol that's on that, that's the Sephiroth. Uh-huh. Damn. Yeah. So the Feel Fedlock, their purpose was to distract the Kate Seed Hay with catnip, riddles, music, and other stuff. Fire was not allowed, for it is said that the Kate Seed Hay or Cat Sith liked the warmth. So, so- um <laughs> Riddles. Uh huh. I will tell you this. My cat loves a good riddle. <laughs> He's still trying to figure out what walks on all four in the morning, two legs at noon, and three legs at night. But, you know, <laughs> he likes them, I think. He kind of just yeah. slow blinked at me when I asked him, but I think he's been thinking about it. So, Oh, yeah. Nothing's better, but, oh, nothing's better than a nice slow blink from a cat. Mm. That's true. Uh-huh. It is said that if you place a bowl of milk outside your door, the soul-stealing fae would bless you. I mean... That just sounds like the soul stealing Fay. Fay. Fay is a um, is a monster because it's probably a food gremlin, just like every cat. <laughs> every cat is a food gremlin. Oh um, yeah, I, I can guarantee that. My once again, the kitten in my household loves red bean paste, <laughs> so clearly he is a food gremlin. Uh huh. So it it is at this point that I stopped doing all research on the cat Sith because I went, oh, I bet that's just a straight up cat. So I, I did some research because it sounds ex- catnip and if catnip and milk are its weaknesses, that's just straight up cat. So given its description and size, I started doing some research and I mm-hmm. found that there's only one species of large cat in Scotland, the Scottish wild cat, Felis Silvestris Grampia, uh, it's a large, dark, and sometimes black cat, and it's very rare. So when I saw that, I thought, nailed it! That's gotta be it. Uh, Kate Seed Hay is this big wild cat. You distract it with catnip and milk, it goes away. And I did think that to be the likely culprit for the Kate Seed Hay, but I found something even better. The Kellis cat, which was thought to be a pure hoax until 1984, where one was caught in a trap and shot by a gamekeeper. The Kellis cat is a black cat with a small white patch on its chest, and it was then discovered that this most elusive creature is a hybrid of the Scottish wild cat and a domestic cat, and it is posited that this is the actual origin of the Kate Seed Hay. Hmm. Yeah. I can see that. That's, that. That totally makes sense to me. Oh, yeah. This is not, by the way, a formal breed of cat. You won't see these wandering around in Scotland. It's what I learned was a land race of a field hybrid. And what that means is a field hybrid, to the best I can explain, has to do with the fact that all species of cat cannot breed with each other. This has to do with where in the timeline these subspecies diverged from their common ancestor. The most popular example that I can think of is the liger or the tigon, which is a combination of a a, a lion and a tiger depending on which, you know, which was male, which is female. I, I feel and, like doing a dance for some reason. Do you? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I just had this, like, 
primal urge to do a dance of some kind <laughs> and vote for a man named Pedro. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Oh. I, I can't explain it. It's just this uh -huh. feeling that's that's it's washing over me. <laughs> oh, I wish I had screen recording software going. <laughs> 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 oh. uh, a land race has to do with adapted features and traits that plants and animals have due to regional agricultural and cultural factors this is how we made different breeds of dogs cats cows etc so it's a combination of these regionally specific uh land races breeding with uh the the scottish wildcat and you get Apparently, soul stealing demon that loves milk. So, my hypothesis for how the uh, Kate Sith became a thing was uh -huh. a cat showed up at a funeral, uh huh, and like sat on the dead person's body. Uh huh. People don't like that. Uh -huh. So then, a set of rules became a thing for how to deal with <laughs> cats sitting on dead people's bodies. Oh, a hundred percent. So it makes sense to me that this would be a thing because at a funeral, especially given the era, there would likely be, especially at wakes and the such, there's typically food about. There's a large group of people. If it's outdoors at that period of time, it'd probably be warm due to the fires. Mm -hmm. So the cats would probably start showing up because there's the warmth and then there's the possibility of finding these scraps. So mm. I think it's a... Uh, yeah, yeah. I think no, it's reasonable how these came about. I, I know how cats work. I have two. <laughs> uh -huh. This is this this screams cat. I have basically an inverse Kate Sith in this house. Uh huh. Because you know, instead of having the chest have the little white patch, he's got the pubes with the white patch. <laughs> oh. So, oh. and he's a monster who who steals my soul every night. Well, since the white patch is on the pelvic region, that makes him a Kate Sithy mamu. Kate Sith Imamu? Yeah, the Imamu from earlier is the, uh... Is that the sexy one, or is that not the sexy one? The That's the Lian Shi. Oh, Lian and Shi. Okay, so yeah. that's a Kate Sith Shi. There we go. We're mixing and mashing. Well, jeez. Now I feel... <laughs> now I feel upset. <laughs> <laughs> so that concludes this episode of Cryptopedia Cast. You can find us at our website, CryptopediaCast.com. Our Instagram is CryptopediaCast. Our Twitter is at CryptopediaCast. We have a SoundCloud, that's SoundCloud.com slash CryptopediaCast. We have an email, CryptopediaCast at gmail.com, or you could contact us at us at CryptopediaCast.com. We have a Facebook group as well if you'd like to join. Just say that you want to join, and we'll uh, we'll approve you. We're just trying to make sure you're not a shoe-selling robot. Mm-hmm, that's important. Uh -huh. And if you can, remember to rate, review, and subscribe, especially if you're on iTunes, Stitcher, and what have you. That's important to get the word out and sort of bump us up on the charts a little bit. And, and share this with your friends if they like uh, monsters or if they're just in the mood for a creature-based Halloween podcast or anything of the sort. You could find me on Instagram.com slash donkey underscore hands. My website is boyerb.com. My email is brandon at cryptopediacast.com. And my Twitter is at Crypto Brandon. Yep. And you can reach me on Instagram at Mew2057. My Twitter is at JF Dunham. My website is currently defunct and being used <laughs> for Cryptopedia. And I thank you, you can... for the sacrifice. Yeah, yeah. Well, because my... I'm not looking for a job right now. So I just, you know, put my website down for a little bit. There's games on there once I bring it back up. So, you know, uh -huh. play some games. <laughs> My email is john at cryptopediacast.com. And as usual, you can find all of our social media links on our website. Um, I'm probably going to be putting some new stuff on that website soon. So stay tuned. We're kind of working on a few things that we're not ready to announce yet. Additionally, you can uh, follow our podcast artist, Tom Hill, at Thomas Michael Hill on Instagram or his website, greatergloryco.com. Uh, you can also email him at tommikehill at gmail.com if you need some commissions. But um, I think that's about it. I think that's it. Oh, and if anyone is interested, we do share episode art, pictures. Sometimes we link to articles on our Twitter and our Instagram. So mm -hmm. if you're interested in some supplemental stuff, 
or some just pictures, feel free to follow us. Yeah, yeah, of course. Also, there was one thing that I forgot I was going to mention, but now I remembered it when you said that. And then uh-huh. after you said it, I lost it because that's the way my brain works. <laughs> um, hmm. <sighs> it feels important. I feel like it was something that mattered in some way. But it now... was. Let's see what we're, we're talking about. Instagram, what, uh, Twitter. Oh, now I remember. Supplemental. Okay. So I don't think we're going to be able to make it because we haven't gotten any uh, suggestions or oh, yeah. about, about ideas for like, you know, listener supported stuff. So if you have stories you want to tell, you can always at us or send us an email. So uh, I'm, I'm going to open this up to ghost stories even because there's some pretty cool. We can get some pretty interesting ghost stories, maybe. Oh, yeah. Uh, cryptid stories, urban legends from where you live, things of that uh-huh. nature. Send it to us. We'll yeah. try to work it into a future episode. We were—I uh-huh. was originally hoping to do like a Halloween-style episode, but we're still kind of gaining our listener base, gaining subscribers, so it's a little more tricky for us right now. Mm-hmm. But yeah. in the future, if, it would be nice to do some listener-supported episodes. Uh huh. E- even if you don't have a story of your own, feel free to post requests. If there's a specific cryptid that you'd like us to do something on, feel free. Send you know, set, share a line with us. And uh, if you want, shoot some articles or something at us as well. And yeah. if you'd like, we're also open to uh, write up some of your own creepy pasta. That could be fun. That yeah, could I, be something fun to do. What will we'll probably happen is I, I was planning on reading some creepy pasta at some point for this show. So, you know, if you'd like to hear me in my my stilted readings of creepy pasta, well, I'm your guy. So, anywho. Um, I'm John. I'm Brandon. And things are going to get weird. (laughs) That was a good one. Yeah. Yeah. There is some... Okay. So... Something... Oh, hmm? Oh, some... Something to share uh, that's unrelated to anything in the episode is I went to Lowe's. I went to the hardware store, as I do yesterday. Mm -hmm. But before that, I made some tacos. And, John, these were some good tacos. I got some dry-aged ground beef. I put tortilla, uh, corn tortillas on a a tray to get ready to put them into the oven. And here's what I did. I, um, I just sort of barely cooked that beef just sort of grayed the outside i put it on the tortillas i minced an onion covered it in that i minced some sharp cheddar sprinkled that on top a little bit of habanero sauce put it in the oven and then set it to broil to melt the cheese and to finish cooking the beef Mm -hmm. now i made two mistakes uh when i went to lowe's Uh, mistake number one was i'm lactose intolerant mistake number two is that broiling just melted the cheese and didn't continue to cook the beef. Oh, no! And the Lowe's near our house, I'm bragging right now because I consider this an inhuman feat of strength. Try holding in diarrhea while going over those five speed bumps. I know exactly what you're talking about. Those speed bumps are the worst. Oh, no. <laughs> Oh no! I wouldn't have been able to do it. There, it was cutting close. <laughs> that was that is actually a superhuman feat that you performed. You might be a cryptid yourself. <laughs>